Okay, round two, uh, chapter 18, the nervous system diseases. <clears throat> so just a, a few terms here with the nervous system. Um, the meninges are basically a layer of tissue that surrounds the, the brain and the spinal cord. Meningitis obviously is inflammation of the meninges. Encephalitis is inflammation of the brain. And then meningoencephalitis is infection of the brain and the meninges. Um, let's see, cerebrospinal fluid, basically the fluid that cushions the central nervous system. And sometimes uh, maybe you've heard of a spinal tap or a spinal. It's also called a lumbar puncture, where they take a long needle in there and remove um, some fluid and do diagnostic tests on there. Um, so the central nervous system includes the green areas, the brain and the spinal cord. It's going to integrate and information and send a plan for how to deal with that information. Okay, so if you touch something that's hot, your central nervous system will, oh, that's hot, and you know, then tell you to move your hand. The peripheral nervous system is gonna be all the nerves that um, basically everything past the spinal cord, um, it's going to input and transmit information. Okay, so there's some basic information on the nervous system. Um, the brain, the spinal cord, and nerves are easy to damage and take uh, a lot to heal if they can heal at all. Um, if you completely damage the spinal cord, um, it won't heal and function properly. Um, so some serious infections of the nervous system can be deadly. Um, and another important note here is that the nervous system does not contain resident microbiota, okay? The digestive system does, the upper respiratory, maybe even the lower respiratory, um, but not the central or not the nervous system, okay? So any, any microbes in the nervous system at all is considered abnormal. So if you were to do a lumbar puncture and it comes back with bacteria in it, there is an infection. That's not normal. Okay, um, this just talks about how some of the gut microbes can affect brain functioning, um, how stress might play a part in that. You can look at that if you are interested. Um, viruses are the most common cause of nervous system infections. Um, think with things like meningitis and encephalitis. And it's good because the viral infections like viral meningitis is usually pretty mild compared to bacterial meningitis. Okay, so um, bacterial meningitis is much more um, concerning generally, not always. Um, viruses are really small. Let's see. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to skip polio in the interest of time because that's not something we see here in the US anymore. Um, so I've decided to skip that. Okay, so we're not really going to cover any of the viral diseases. We're going to talk about um, bacterial meningitis because that's the more severe form, even though viral is more common. Um, so bacterial diseases of the central nervous system. Okay, we'll talk about the peripheral nervous system here in a little later. Um, so meningitis, rare but more dangerous. 20% um, of bacterial meningitis patients suffer long-term problems, hearing or brain hearing loss or other neurological problems. And there's 11% mortality rate even with treatment. So it's a very dangerous situation. And bacterial meningitis progresses very quickly. Okay, so um, needs to be uh, addressed very quickly if you start to experience some of the symptoms. And some of those symptoms are um, rapid onset petechial rash, where those blood vessels are bursting. Um, we don't have this 
slide, but some of the other slides told us that there's a fever, a headache, and another thing that is involved with meningitis that's maybe um, kind of a key sign or symptom would be um, a neck ache, neck pain. You get like a stiff neck, a very sore neck. Okay, so if you have a headache, a fever, and a very sore neck, and it's not because you laid down wrong, um, you might want to get checked out for meningitis. Meningococcal meningitis is caused by Neisseria meningitis. Treatment, um, antibiotics can be deadly if not treated right away. Um, and there are three types of vaccines in the U.S. to help with that. And this is one, um, meningococcal meningitis is one that if you live in the dorms or you um, live in a resident housing area um, in close proximity like a dorm or military barracks, they'll uh, generally require you to have that vaccine because it can be easily spread. Okay, so here's the snapshot there. I'll let you guys read through this. Um, there's several types of, of meningitis. There's several types of bacteria that can cause it. Fungi can also cause meningitis. Um, but uh, let's see, strep pneumoniae, streptococcus pneumoniae can cause meningitis as well. Um, let's see, common causes of bacterial meningitis in ages. Um, you don't need to worry about that. But strep pneumoniae causes uh, pneumococcal meningitis. And that is one where you start out with a nose or kind of an upper respiratory infection. And then that can spread then through the bloodstream and um, basically affect the brain. And it breaks down, there's a barrier so that your blood doesn't cross into your brain. It's basically a protective mechanism so you don't get pathogens in the brain. Um, and this will actually break down that barrier and the bacteria will grow inside and invade the brain. Um, there's toxins and other virulence factors that can cause that. There is a vaccine for pneumococcal meningitis. The meningococcal meningitis won't prevent pneumococcal, so there's different vaccines for those. Um, and then here's a snapshot of this disease as well. Okay. Um, listeria, listeriosis, um, caused by listeria meningitis is another bacterial central nervous system um, infectious disease caused by Listeria monocytogenes. It's a gram-positive rod. And remember, we've talked about these guys before. They can grow in the refrigerator. Okay, um, this is why pregnant women shouldn't eat lunch meats that are over so many days old, or some doctors say just don't eat lunch meats. Um, because mo the refrigerator inhibits growth of most pathogens, um, except for uh, listeria is one that can actually grow and their numbers can increase in the refrigerator, just like if you were to set it outside um, in room temperatures. Um, some characteristics of uh, listeria meningitis. Um, it's the fourth most common. Um, it is transmitted from a foodborne, oh my goodness, foodborne progression. Okay, so it would start out as a digestive issue where you consumed the lunch meat and it was in the fridge and it was contaminated with listeria and um then that it the disease basically progressed and into meningitis okay it's rare but it can happen most people with listeria are asymptomatic and it doesn't bother them um, but it can cause issues in pregnant women and those who have um immunocompromised uh, systems, okay? So in healthy people, you know, there may be some cold-like symptoms. It's not that big of a deal. Maybe a little bit of vomiting or diarrhea, oops, in the digestive issues, um, but it can be more severe, severe and develop into nervous system infections like meningitis. 
Okay, so uh, listeria meningitis would start out with um, ingesting something and it would um, progress from the common cold digestive type issues into meningitis. Okay, one thing about listeria is they produce these little actin filaments in their tails and they can actually burrow through and burst through from cell to cell invading as they go. Um, okay, so you might wanna put a line in your notes in between this, um, this slide and this slide because we're moving from the central nervous system to the peripheral nervous system now, and we're gonna stay with bacteria. And we're gonna talk about a couple of disease, diseases in which the bacterial toxins are gonna to be pretty potent. And these two, um, we're gonna talk about tetanus and botulism, have neurotoxins, the toxins that affect neurons or nerve cells in the peripheral nervous system. So first one is botulism caused by Clostridium botulinum, gram-positive rod. Again, anaerobe produces a neurotoxin. And it doesn't really like high pH, it forms spores. Okay, so like Clostridium perfringens, like that causes uh, gas gangrene, this is in the same um, family, endospore forming. Okay, botulinum toxin is very, very powerful. One nanogram can kill a human. Um, botulism is a reportable disease. So if a doctor, uh, a clinic has a patient with botulism, they would have to report that to the CDC. And there's different ways that botulism can occur. It can be through food ingestion, through a wound, or through infant botulism, which is usually picked up from eating um, honey uh, too young in life. Um, Soils and honey, soil contamination and honey um, are typical um, places where the endospores are found. Um, remember, endospores can uh, really withstand a lot of uh, harsh conditions. So cooking, uh, remember we do canning, pressurized cooking, um, to prevent endospores from, uh, from surviving and, and re- uh, activating and, and causing disease. Okay, so beets, carrots, uh, green beans, um, if they're canned improperly, can uh, allow those endospores to uh, germinate. Um, let's see. Oh, where is this? <laughs> Foodborne botulism can cause constipation because it relaxes the muscles along the, the smooth muscles along the digestive tract and it, the food just kind of sits there as it's going through. Um, but really what I wanted to point out was the mechanism of how botulism works. Okay, it's mode of action basically. Um, so with, I wish we had a, oh, we do have a picture. Hold on. Okay, here's botulism. Here are the neurons sending messages to the muscle. This is muscle, okay? Botulism basically causes muscles to stay relaxed. Botulism prevents the neurotransmitter, acetylcholine, from telling the muscles to basically contract okay it stops that muscle from being able to contract okay that's what botulism does people that have uh, botox injections what that does is relaxes the muscles um, in the in the skin in the face and it relaxes it and relaxes out those wrinkles um, Let's see. So it prevents muscle contraction. We'll see tetanus is the exact opposite of that here in just a little bit. Um, but there can be long-term effects um, and long-term long damage to those muscles um, if that is allowed to progress. You would treat with antibiotics. Prevention. Um, botulism is why children under one year should not eat honey. 
is the risk of botulism. Watch out for uh, improperly canned foods. Um, if the cans are foamy when you open it, like if you were to uh, home can something or um, something were to go wrong at the food distribution plant um, and it opened up and it had a terrible odor and it was foamy, don't eat that. Okay, so here's a snapshot of this. And then tetanus is also called lockjaw, caused by another clostridium, clostridium tetani. It produces tetanospasmin. It is also a neurotoxin. <clears throat> it is also an anaerobe, so it's going to want to get in those deep, deep puncture wounds. Okay, it's found in the soil. And with tetanus, the muscles contract very powerfully, like a strong contraction, and then they don't relax. And so um, this is, there's actually, I've seen pictures um, actually of babies and actual, not drawings, actual people um, contracting and it's very painful. The back will arch. Um, and with tetanus and botulism both, um, if a person were to die from that, it's usually from respiratory arrest because their uh, diaphragms and intercostal muscles can't relax and contract to help expand and uh, relax the rib cage to exchange gas. Um, they call it locked jaw because um, patients will have their jaws clenched shut and they won't be able to, they'll have to be fed in alternative ways. And um, that's one of the telltale signs of, of tetanus. Um, so here, um, so botulinum toxin prevents muscles from contracting. Tetanospasmin basically blocks the uh, signal to tell the muscles to relax. And so the muscles just keep contracting and contracting and contracting and, and aren't uh, able to relax because there's no signal to tell them to relax. Um, so you'll have intense muscle spasms, drooling, sweating, all kinds of uncomfortable signs and symptoms. Um, let's see. Can cause paralysis, prevents muscle relaxation. Complication, irrever irreversible damage to the neurons. Um, in untreated cases, there's a 50% mortality rate. Even with supportive care, tetanus is very, very serious, 10% mortality rate, even if there is supportive care. One um, good thing about oops, tetanus is that, say you step on the rusty nail today, it has a, oh, I didn't put the um, little recap box on here, but it has a long incubation period. So, um, say you haven't had a tetanus shot in the last 10 years and you step on that rusty nail. If you go to the doctor today and they're like, if you had a tetanus shot and they, you say no, they can give you that tetanus shot and that will actually um, give you some protection. Uh, and it, the, the vaccine will have an opportunity to work and start get the immune system kicked in um, to help protect you. Okay, so that is one good thing about tetanus, but it is a very serious, very terrible disease. So always make sure you've had your tetanus shot. Okay, so a million cases a year around the world. All right, so that um, finishes up our chapter 17, 18 lecture. I will um, get this posted, make sure, oh, there's a tetanus video. Make sure you watch the video on tetanus. So there's three videos that you'll watch for grade um, and check out the uh, daily checklist and have a good weekend. Take those idea surveys. Talk to you later.